In a remarkable exercise spanning 15 years, the last survivors of the Great War were interviewed on film. These are unique stories of courage, sacrifice and tragedy, told by the men who were there. These extraordinary interviews have been brought together for the first time. In this film, we hear from the veterans who survived one of the most infamous battles of the entire war, the Battle of the Somme. I'm like this in the trench with a cigarette, my last cigarette in my fingers. And I was like that. Oh, I don't mind turning there. All feelings of humanity leaves you when, when you're fighting. You've got no feelings of humanity right then. Afterwards, yes, perhaps. These are the last voices of World War I. On the Western Front, 1916 began as the previous year had ended, in stalemate. Both Allied and German forces lay holed up in fortified trenches which stretched from the Belgian coast to the Swiss Alps, and attempts by either side to break the deadlock had proven ultimately unsuccessful. In Sir Douglas Haig, however, the British Army had a new commander-in-chief, and he quickly began planning the big push that he hoped would prove decisive. After much deliberation, it was agreed that the British would support the French in a massed attack on German positions along a 25-mile front north of the River Somme. These plans were quickly thwarted, however, when German forces attacked the French fortress town of Verdun. As French divisions were hastily transferred to protect the town, the burden of responsibility on the Somme fell to the British. In this rolling, chalky landscape, the Germans had dug deep, well-protected defences in the high ground. Breaking through these positions would be difficult and dangerous. But for some of those who'd been in the front lines for over a year, the big push couldn't come soon enough. 21-year-old Londoner Richard Hawkins was an officer in the Royal Fusiliers. People said that Haig was wrong in, uh, in making us go and fight the enemy. Damn it, we couldn't sit there forever. You got to get on with the job. Uh, the French had been badly, very nearly knocked out. And we got to go get on with the job and kill the, kill the Germans. The date of the offensive was originally set for the 29th of June. But owing to bad weather, it was postponed to the 1st of July. A week before, the biggest artillery bombardment in history opened up on the Western Front, as over a million and a half shells rained down on German positions. In preparation for the attack, more men from Kitchener's volunteer army arrived in France to take up positions in the front line. Among them was 21-year-old Tom Dewing from Norfolk. We were all convinced that this was the push which was to which was to end the war. We were certainly very impressed with the thunder of the guns because it started all at once. And uh, terrific. And it went on and on and on. Thunder, thunder, thunder. With a practice here, you could, you could pick out the individual types of gun firing. The bombardment was intended to shatter both the German defences and the will of the defenders. According to the plans, once the shelling had stopped, the infantry would be able to advance across no man's land with ease, opening up routes for the cavalry to exploit at will. 19-year-old infantryman Arthur Wagstaff had complete confidence in the British plans. Our instructions the previous day, of course, were that when you make the attack tomorrow morning, don't run. 
uh, walk across. We, we believed that our bombardment of the German front line would be knocking out quite a lot of, of uh, German troops. So hopefully when we got there, there wouldn't be many there. The attack would begin at 7.30 a.m. with wave after wave of men going over the top along a 25-mile front. Despite the overwhelming sense of confidence, as zero hour approached, even the most eager of officers began to feel some degree of trepidation at the task ahead. We couldn't help being a bit frightened, I think. But you, you, you couldn't show it. Got to bottle it up. You were surrounded with a lot of damn good chaps. They were all damn good fellas out to fight for their country. As Kitchener said, your king and country need you. And we were out. That was the first you did get got shot. Well, that's too bad. As they waited with anticipation for the attack to begin, few could have any idea that in the hours that followed, they would become embroiled in the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army. On the morning of July the 1st, 1916, over 120,000 British troops waited for the signal that would launch perhaps the most infamous battle in history, the Battle of the Somme. A week-long artillery bombardment had sent shrapnel, high explosive and poison gas shells along a 25-mile stretch of the German lines. The ground assault that was to follow was expected to be a walkover. Such was the confidence of British generals in a swift breakthrough that cameras were allowed to record the events for cinema goers back home. But as zero hour approached, there were none of the usual images of happy men grinning for the cameras. These Lancashire Fusiliers had every reason to look afraid. Little did they or the majority of frontline troops know, but the week-long bombardment had failed to destroy the German defenses. Instead, the enemy sheltered deep within their fortified dugouts and with machine guns and rifles at the ready, they waited. They couldn't know it, but within the next half an hour, nearly all these men would be dead or wounded. As the big guns fell silent and troops in the front line readied themselves for the attack, a series of huge mines were detonated close to German positions to destroy enemy strongholds and provide shelter for the advancing troops. Just two minutes later, the Battle of the Somme would begin. From his vantage point on high ground, signaller Tom Dewing watched as the catastrophic events of the day began to unfold. I remember the mine going up. We had been told beforehand that it was going up, and there was a terrific explosion. The whole ground shook. And that came a few seconds after the, after the uh, explosion itself. At 7.30 a.m., the whistles blew to begin the attack. And along the length of the front line, men scrambled over trench parapets and made their way towards the German lines. Within minutes, thousands were cut down by German machine gun fire and shrapnel. At the northern end of the line, Arthur Wagstaff went over the top with the 56th London Division near the village of Gomcourt. As soon as we got the instructions to jump over the top, we went, and our company sergeant major was sitting on the parapet and yelling to the boys, go on boys, over the top, over the top. And then as I came up into the trench, I could see two or three of our fellows, including two brothers who were lying dead in the trench. They had been killed, of course, by the German gunfire. 
Then we looked, looked along the line and we realised there were very few of us left. In these woods further south, the Lonsdale Battalion prepared to advance across this open ground to attack a German strongpoint known as Mouquet Farm. 22-year-old Fred Francis was amongst those waiting for the attack to begin. At zero hour, when we filed out of this wood, the colonel patted me on the back and said, good luck, son. But we were literally sitting ducks. They just mowed us down like grass in the hayfield. Shortly after 7.30 a.m., signaler Tom Dewing looked out across this valley as men from the 34th Division made their way across the sloping ground towards the German front line. In the first place, there was a certain amount of mist. And then when you add to that the um, enormous amount of smoke from the, uh, from the barrage, a great deal was hidden. When the mist cleared and the smoke cleared, we were able to see the infantry going forward. In some cases, they didn't get very far. They were just wiped out. Seconds after leaving the safety of these woods, Fred Francis was shot in the hip by machine gun fire as all around him, his colleagues were being mown down. And I dropped on my face. I put my steel helmet on the back of my head and I could hear the shrapnel drop, dropping on my steel helmet. I just said to myself, this is, a, this is the last of the Lonsdale Battalion. There'll be no battalion left after this. And there wasn't, and never has been. I'm the only survivor, I think, of the original Lonsdale Battalion. With so many casualties lying wounded in no man's land, the job of stretcher bearers was dangerous and exhausting. But in the heat of the battle, they had little time to reflect on the precariousness of their situation. 20-year-old traveling salesman Joe Yarwood had joined the Royal Army Medical Corps after being handed a white feather, the symbol of cowardice. He was proving his bravery now. You were just walking like an automaton. You know, you want to keep going backward and forward, and you didn't bother to think a lot about things. It's true, you know, if you are uh, got something on your mind, it, we our job was to get rid of these people as quickly as possible. It was simply as simple as that. Keep going, keep going, keep going. The first one I took out with poor fellow shot through the head and we had to lift him down onto a stretcher and then take him off. And it was a very uncomfortable feeling because they got this fellow right through the head and we were expecting <laughs> any part of our body any minute. We finally got the poor fellow down and one fellow was walking behind, hanging onto his wrist because we found that there was a tendency for him to snatch their bandage off. And when we put him down, what did he do? And I, like a silly fool, had felt sorry for the poor fellow, and I put my tuning under him. And I had his brains, and he then, to show a bit of encouragement, he vomited all over my tunic. And, uh, well, anyway, we carried the poor devil out. I made inquiries about him subsequently, and it was alleged by his comrades of his particular regiment that he was walking about Bradford or wherever he came from with a plate in his head. But it wasn't all bad news that morning. Significant advances were made in the southern sector where Richard Hawkins went over the top. 
we moved up into the uh, front line trench. Every man was given a packet of woodbines. Stupid thing to say, but I went over smoking a number 11 of dollar. And that uh, uh, sort of overall cigarette. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter. And um, zero, I was 7.30, I think it was a lovely morning, and over the top we went. And actually, we had um, a very good day. The Manchester's were on our right were held up, and somebody else on our left was held up, and that's why we uh, had to stop, really. Otherwise, some idiot said we were going to walk straight through to Berlin. However, successes like this were sadly few and far between. By the end of the first day, nearly 20,000 British men were killed and over 40,000 wounded. It remains the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Arthur Wagstaff spent the entire day in a shell hole pinned down by machine gun fire, only to emerge after the hours of darkness. Most of his battalion had been lost. We considered we were, we were lucky as we went down the communication trench to this tiny village. We reckoned we were lucky to have survived that day because it was a terrific slaughter. For those that did survive, hearing the battalion roll call at the end of that day was devastating. How can you describe seeing a mere handful of men come where you, where you, you were used to seeing a battalion? And we weren't the only ones who felt sick. The colonels were sitting in front of what was left of their men, sobbing. There were so few, so few men left. In the days that followed, exhausted troops waited for fresh orders as the full scale of the catastrophe began to sink in. But to press home even the smallest of victories, the battle had to continue, and General Haig and his French counterparts agreed to consolidate their action in the southern sector of the line, where advances had been made. Meanwhile, fresh troops were sent up to the front line to take the place of those who had been killed. It was a fact not lost on 19-year-old officer Norman Collins from Hartlepool, who arrived on the Somme with the Seaforth Highlanders. You knew the, the, you knew by that time, the full horrors, the horrors of the war. We were replacing casualties, so every, for every person who went out to replace a casualty, he knew that somebody had either died or was in the hospital. We were fully aware of that. 19-year-old Archie Richards from Cornwall arrived on the Somme in late summer, part of a highly trained group of men at the heart of a top-secret plan aimed to smash the German lines. As his unit moved forward, the sights that awaited him were horrific. In many parts of the front, the dead from the previous days and weeks of fighting still lay where they had fallen. We were moving up and... Uh... We had to go over uh, the old trenches, the old trenches and bodies and everything else, you know, and then the stink. Oh, the smell was terrible, terrible, and it was hot. 
arms and legs sticking out of trenches and all this sort of stuff. Sticking out of the, yeah. Rotting bodies, oh, terrible. But for men like 20-year-old Robbie Burns from Glasgow, who'd been at the front since 1915, these horrors were now part of everyday life. Yeah, we know what it's like now. You know what it's like. You know what it's like to sleep. You know what it is like to eat. You know what it's like to go over the top. Well, yes, there's no doubt about it. You get hardened sometimes. And you wonder all the time when it's going to finish. When is it going to finish? And you're hoping you get a blighty one somewhere. It's not serious. Some men were so desperate to escape the action, they would do anything to get a blighty wound. An injury not bad enough to be life-threatening, but which would require treatment back home. The chap is sitting next to me, lying on his stomach. His legs up in the air, like that. He's lying down there. His legs up in the air. I said, keep your legs down. Why? I said, you'll get shot. He said, I want shot. I said, why? He said, well, I want one in the leg, then I'll get one for Blighty. I won't need to go on any further. I want wounded. I want wounded in the leg. I don't want to stand up and get shot in the stomach. He was looking for a wound in his leg. And I said to this chap here, I said, a good idea that he did the same. He just lay in his stomach with his legs up in the air like that, hoping to get a bullet in so that he wouldn't have to go on any further. The bond that developed between men fighting in these conditions ran deep, and some officers felt a paternal affection for the men in their command. That was your closest feeling at the time. Uh, your, your affection for the men under you. There's no doubt about that. And when a man in his company was killed or injured, it was an officer's responsibility to write to his family to inform them. But as every day brought more and more casualties, keeping up this duty was difficult for even the most diligent. And sometimes he had about 60 letters to write. And he didn't even know he was writing, who he was writing about. But we always tried to make a nice letter to the mother or father because we felt for them, we understood what they were feeling. Thousands more letters would be written before the Battle of the Somme was over. In the meantime, the British were about to unleash a secret weapon they hoped would bring them victory. Archie Richards was one of those selected for the new tank corps. At first, the crews were as mystified as anyone by the giant machines, but quickly began to realize their battle-winning potential. We saw them, and we talked together about it, and we said, well, what, what is this? They got tracks, and they must have got an engine, and they must crawl, crawl around. You know what I mean? And uh, we saw them up that way. An armored crawler, that's what I call them. And uh, of course, when we got in them and got moving around with them, uh, well, we knew exactly what, what they were for. And the armaments, when we got inside, we saw the armaments. We said, well, this is, this is really it. As the Battle of the Somme entered its third month, the crews prepared themselves for their baptism of fire. The age of the tank had arrived. Throughout the July and August of 1916, the Allies made slow progress on the Somme. Gains were made both in the north and south sectors, but at great cost. By the beginning of September, General Haig called for a further all-out attack to break through German lines once and for all. All available divisions would be required for the offensive to try to smash through German positions between the villages of Fleur and Corselet. It would be the greatest British attack since the opening day on the Somme. 
The offensive would also see the unveiling of Britain's new secret weapon, the tank. These armored land ships had been designed to plow their way across no man's land, to break through barbed wire and destroy German machine gun positions. However, they were untested in battle, and Haig was well aware of the potential limitations of these new mechanical monsters, and unsure of the best way to employ them. But as the first tanks rumbled into position, they gave a considerable boost to frontline troops about to go into action. I was out in a trench out there with some others, and I could hear a, a purr, purr going on. And I thought, what's that noise? It's getting louder and louder. And I stood on the fire step. And I could see something moving. Like what we call in Scotland a steam road roller. And I said, look. And they all started looking. Some got up on the parapet. And the Germans, too, were up on the parapet, looking at what was happening. And we could see these things moving. And behind them, there were probably four or five or six soldiers running behind with their bayonets fixed. The Battle of Flair Corselet began on the morning of the 15th of September, 1916. This ridge, less than two miles south of Flair, formed part of the British front line. And it was here that 19-year-old George Louth from Hampshire waited nervously for the attack to begin. I'm like this in the trench with a cigarette, my last cigarette in my fingers. And I was like that. Oh, I don't mind telling you. When we got over the top, I laid down. After running forward, now, we, I could hear the whistle of the bullet scored by. And uh, I saw a line of... Uh, Germans come up on top of the trench. I said, I thought to myself, Christ, they're coming towards us. But they wouldn't. They were going away. Then I started walking. In the confusion of battle, George found himself lost near these fields at Delville Wood, but he was quickly ordered to get back into action. And an officer came running out from somewhere, I don't know who he was, but he came out waving this revolver, and he said, lads, this way, I'll shoot the first bastard and go the other way. And then I try to catch up with him when they were going forward. But I somehow got lost and went out through the wood, started walking across the played field and on the, on the way, I saw a tank. And uh, when he went across, uh, it stopped. But halfway across, which was about three kilometers away from the, from Flores. The tank was number D7 with Archie Richards at the guns. It had broken down just a short distance from its start point, and it wasn't the only one. The opening day of battle highlighted serious flaws with the Army's new weapon. Of the 49 tanks available for action that morning, only 32 had reached the starting point for battle. Of these, 14 either suffered mechanical failure, got stuck in shell holes, or were knocked out by enemy fire. But for those that kept going, the effects were dramatic. When Archie and his crew were given another vehicle, they made devastating progress. Nothing got in their way. We had to go over previous dead and dead that you'd, you'd killed. If they fell in your way, you had to go over. We, we never deviated the tanks for anything. Only, only uh, for action, you know. All feelings of humanity leaves you when you're when you're fighting. 
you say to yourself, well, it's either him or me. See? So, I got to get in first. So you, you've got no feelings of humanity. Right then. Afterwards, yes, perhaps. And inside the tanks, conditions were almost unbearable. Well, the atmosphere was very, very sickening, really. Especially when you were in action and all the traps closed down. And splinters from the machine guns flying inside when we were in action. Flying all about little sparks. A terrible, terrible noise with the with our guns firing, the German guns firing, the machine guns going, and the noise of our engine and everything. Oh, yeah, shocking. But despite the conditions for the crews, when the tanks managed to get to the German trenches, the effect was nothing short of spectacular. Hundreds surrendered as panic swept through the lines. They'd never seen a anything like it before but when they when they saw we was armed with the uh, uh, small guns and machine guns they gave up right away it's surprising we we hadn't time to get on top of the trench before they was out with their arms up A week after the start of the battle, the village of Flair was in British hands. Although the tanks had revealed their weaknesses, they had undoubtedly played a significant part in the advance, and their crews were heralded as heroes. But the big push had fallen short of its objective. British troops had failed to break through German lines, and many formidable German defence positions remained intact. Conditions on the Somme were fast becoming unbearable. Shell fire had churned up the battlefields, and in places, British frontline positions were little more than a series of connected shell holes. Simply getting food rations and water to the men at the front was becoming a logistical nightmare. On the 13th of November, the Allies launched an attack on Beaumont Hamel, a village which had been part of a failed assault on the 1st of July. On that day, the 1st Newfoundland Regiment had been virtually wiped out in the attack and their bodies still littered the battlefield. As zero hour approached, 19-year-old officer Norman Collins gave encouragement to the men in his command. You're looking at your watch and you to see zero hour. And then you look and see that your men, the men you're going to go over the top with, are left and right, are equipped, and ready to go. And then you, you encourage them, right and left, to go with you, all go together. So you sort of shepherded them over as well as you could. And that's, that's the only description I could give you. You were a shepherd. <laughs> Uh, yes. And all the time, I have no doubt whatever that I was as frightened as anything. And hoping, probably even have a faint hope, that I would survive. After an heroic effort, Beaumont Hamill was captured later that same day. But there was to be no rest for Norman Collins, who was given a grim task. I was told to collect the newly killed dead, which I did. I, I took a little stretcher bearers. Uh, unfortunately, the stretcher bearers, a number of them, they were related to the ones who were dead. And uh, it was a bit upsetting. Some of them were their brothers, and brothers and cousins, especially the Scottish regiment. Yeah, we had such a lot of the same name, clan name, you see, MacLean. And they, of course, were very upset. 
very, very upset. But it wasn't only his own men that he was ordered to bury. Then I was told to go back into the no man's land, <coughs> or rather what was no man's land, and bury the old dead. That is, the dead of the Newfoundland Regiment, who had been killed there on July the 1st. The first one I saw, the first one I came across, with his hair growing, hair growing out of his, still growing from his face. When I touched it, the rats ran out. There was nothing left under the putty except a bone. I just realized then, for me, what death was. A horrible form of death, too. Not long after leading the attack on Beaumont Hamel, Norman Collins's position came under heavy shell fire. I knew that this shell, which was the scream was getting louder and louder, uh, was had my name on it. And I wasn't knocked down, but I knew I was hit. And I put my hand down, and I, I felt that my hand, I saw my hand was covered in blood, but I turned round and all my men were on the floor, either dead or wounded. And they were crying out, they were very badly wounded, some of them. Putting the lives of his men before his own, Norman helped the wounded into an ambulance, only getting in himself once the last man was safe. He was on his way home to Blighty. So I got into the ambulance, uh, having completed my mission, I suppose, and off we went. And as the ambulance drove away, you could hear the gunfire getting, getting farther and farther away as you went along. And finally, there were no guns at all. The Battle of the Somme finally ended on the 19th of November, 1916. In the four months of fighting, the Allies had captured little more than six miles of ground at a cost of over 600,000 men killed or wounded. The debate over whether Haig's tactics to wage a war of attrition were right continues to this day, but many of the men who followed his orders in the summer of 1916 felt happy to have done so. One of those was 20-year-old Robbie Burns, whose war came to an end when he was hit by shrapnel. Despite nearly losing his leg, he remained optimistic about his contribution to the war effort. I was happy. I knew I did something for my country. I felt happy and I still feel happy. But yes, I still feel very happy that I was in that war and that came out. Because as we say, if it hadn't been for us, a lot of people wouldn't be here today. And I still maintain that. Some of those fellows gave their lives so that other people could live. And I still contend that they saved us all, they saved the country. Another whose physical injuries would stay with him for the rest of his life was 19-year-old George Louth. Having spent nearly two years at the front, the deafening noise of artillery fire had seriously damaged his hearing, and he became a danger to himself and his colleagues. Now, going back one night, I went back with the sergeant. And uh, he said, stop, stop, he said. We stopped by a hedge. And uh, he said, well, wait here a minute. I said, what'd you stop for? He said, can't you hear that going across? I said, what? All oh, them shells. You can't hear it. I said, no, I can't hear it. Oh, he said, you're no good to me. And uh, I started crying. 
because they went all deaf. I couldn't hardly hear what they were talking about. So I decided that I told myself I'm going to go sick in the morning, find out what it is. George's deafness was confirmed by the doctors and he was sent home to England, where he spent the rest of the war working on the land. But for some of those who fought on the Somme, the injuries were mental rather than physical, as living with the constant threat of death shattered minds as well as bodies. During the course of the Great War, a new medical condition was discovered by doctors treating soldiers exposed to frontline action. Shell shock. By the end of the war, some 80,000 British soldiers were diagnosed with this debilitating condition, which caused shakes, tremors, and periods of extreme anxiety. Having spent two terrifying months in a tank during the Battle of the Somme, 19-year-old Archie Richards from Cornwall began to feel the mental effects of frontline duty. I was shell-shocked at that time. Oh, yes, I, there was no doubt about that. I was shell-shocked. I wasn't in my right senses or anything else, you know. Makes you feel uh, cringy and it makes you feel, I don't know, it makes you feel bad in yourself, real bad. You, 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 you begin to do like this, and I never did that before. But every time a big shell crashed, okay, the, the tremendous corrupt noise they make, oh, like a crashing, like, well, I don't know what. A terrible crash, because they were dropping near, see? And every time, every time one dropped out, I quenched up like this. Well, I did, never did that before. So that shows I was, I was shocked. And I couldn't, couldn't believe myself at the time. I couldn't believe it. That I, I thought my nerves would, would carry me, but no, it broke my nerve. These symptoms could manifest themselves years later, even in the most able of soldiers. 21-year-old officer Richard Hawkins was sent home to England after being wounded on the Somme. After the war, he had a successful career in sales and advertising, but often struggled with a nervous condition caused by his experiences in the front line. After the war, I was troubled for a good many years by a, a difficulty in speaking. It was hardly a stammer. It was a stuttering. But it was awfully difficult in business occasion to go to a meeting and have to say something. It was a tremendous strain on one's um, nervous system, which had pretty well been shattered after 19 months and the front line pretty well. But one, and one couldn't sleep at night and that sort of thing. Despite all this, Richard always looked back on his wartime experiences with great pride and a deep affection for the men in his command. All nice, decent blokes. We all had great fun, really. Tremendous fun. Enjoyed ourselves. We really, I personally enjoyed the running war. I think I don't know why, but it was great fun. For all the horrors experienced by those who fought in the Battle of the Somme, the lasting memory for many is of lost colleagues. After the war, Norman Collins experienced a vivid apparition a haunting tribute to the friends who had given their lives for king and country. I had a vision, and I was standing in, in a trench, and at eye level, there were, 
There were legs going, feet, marching, marching feet going along. No, no heads, just feet, legs, legs marching along. And there were all the men, all the men I visualized who were killed in the war. And there they were going on, marching away, marching into, into a distance where I would never follow, you see. All the people I knew were gone, except me.